Yeah, thank you. This is, I feel like I'm competing with one of the really first spring-like feeling evenings that we've had, and so I appreciate your taking the time to come out. Um, I'm not ready for spring, so <laughs> a lot of these critters, though, are coming, whether we are ready or not. So, yeah, let's launch right into it. The, what I'm going to try to cover tonight with you are these topics. We're going to focus really broadly just what, what, why should we care about invertebrates generally, invertebrate conservation globally, and then drill down to Maine a little bit. But then I want to quickly get into what are some of the tools that we have that we use to, to conserve, to identify and conserve invertebrates in Maine, in particular our department. So I'll talk about survey, some examples of surveys, research, environmental review, and outreach projects that we um, can sort of leverage to help conserve invertebrates. And then we'll talk briefly about you guys and other partners and funding sources that help make this happen, and then open it up if there's time for some discussion at the end. So big picture now. I don't know if the lights are where we want them to be, but if, OK, good. You can see that. The, the, um, you've heard about this term biodiversity, right? It's a it's sort of a heady term that gets knocked around quite a bit. Um, and, and, and if you care about biodiversity, that is all forms of life at all scales of organization, you pretty much have to care about invertebrates by definition because they are the dominant form of life on Earth. Just the insects, I mean, this is a dated slide, and insects are now, there's about a million species of insects identified on Earth. The patterns are all about the same. There's now two, two million species roughly documented uh, on Earth. Their estimates are that there could be anywhere between three and 30 million species yet to, you know, um, still to be determined. So while we're looking for that single cellular possible uh, evidence of life on a distant stellar galaxy at billions and billions of dollars, we still have a lot of complex life forms right here on Earth that have yet to be identified and, and named. And, ha and half of them are insects, and uh, two-thirds of all animals are insects. And in fact, in this column here, that with a sort of charismatic uh, crane on top of it, most of the organisms in the uh, that make up non-insect animals are invertebrates. So they're non, there's things like spiders and crustaceans and millipedes and worms and all kinds of marine invertebrate taxa. And just to sort of bring this home and make it real, maybe a little more real for you, just, just here in Maine, if we take a, a group of organisms that you're probably relatively familiar with, butterflies, butterflies and moths, there's about 3,000 species of butterflies and moths identified or known from Maine. So just in, the, in that, and there's 26 orders of insects. We're talking about one order of insects. And in just in this one group of insects, we're talking about six and a half times all the number of birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and fish known from the state of Maine, just in one, one order of insects. So, you sort of, that's why if you, if you care about biodiversity, you sort of by definition have to care about these little guys. In fact, the famous Harvard uh, biologist E.O. Wilson, who's um, still writing prolifically, I, I can barely keep up, he seems to write a book a year, but one of my favorites was The Diversity of Life. He went on to say that so important are insects and other arthropods that if all were to disappear, humanity probably could not last more than a few months. And what, he was, what's he, what he's referring to is this incredible list of ecosystem functions that invertebrates play, sort of unseen, unheard, percolating in the background, doing things that basically make life possible on Earth. And we don't, I don't have time to go through all of these, but let's just talk about a couple of them. You know, Food Chain Foundation, it's sort of a overly simplistic few words, but we're talking about, about quite literally that, the, the whole structure of the food chain, the organisms that you see out at your bird feeder, uh, 
uh, flying around your barn at night, or uh, the, the fish that you catch, those, all of the vertebrates that you enjoy as so-called quote-unquote wildlife just wouldn't be here without uh, the incredible role that invertebrates play. Most freshwater fish in Maine are insectivorous. Most breeding birds in Maine are insectivorous. All of our bats, uh, those that remain, are, are insectivorous. Um, crop pollination. This is uh, kind of an important role that bees and butterflies and beetles and flies um, play. And, uh, and, and, and in fact, up to a third of the US diet is, is comprised of uh, insect pollinated crops, not just Europe, by European honeybees, but by, by wild uh, pollinators that we have right here. And, so, and, and you can put an economic value, it's not easy to do, and if you read some of these papers that have tried to do that, there's a lot of assumptions, obviously, and how, how do you quantify an ecosystem service, but there's been a few um, prominent papers published on the subject, and it's not trivial in terms of the values that are attributed to some of the, the annual uh, values that are attributed to some of these services. And yet, and sort of the if court of public opinion, or it's it's really uh, invertebrates kind of get the sh get short shrift. <laughs> um, this is an interesting study that Stephen Keller did out, out at University of Michigan in the mid '80s, where he basically asked the question. He did a very large poll, <coughs> and he posed the scenario where if a large uh, energy right of way project were to be uh, introduced to the Midwest to introduce a new power source at a lower price, would you be willing to uh, pay a slightly higher premium for that power source if the project accommodated an endangered mammal or an endangered bird or an endangered reptile, et cetera? And basically it played out as you see there in terms of the uh, folks' responses. And, it, and basically, uh, I think when he asked the question if, if an endangered bird or mammal had to be mitigated for and the cost of your power source was going to go up, would you be you know, w willing to do that? And he, d he did different incremental, power, in incremental fee uh, schedule that I don't have time to go into. But basically, 80 to 90 percent of the public said, sure, I'd be willing to do that. If it's a large organism that looks, you know, that's furry, has big eyes, and looks a little bit like me. <laughs> um, when he asked the question, how about for an endangered snake, it dropped off precipitously. Um, and that is an endangered snake here in Maine, actually. That's the black racer. And when he asked about uh, an endangered invertebrate, unfortunately, he picked a spider. Um, and it dropped off even more. And so there's really a disconnect between the, the ecosystem services, the, the importance these organisms play in, in our fauna and how the public values them. I will put in a plug. Uh, I just reread this paper again recently. He, he, he did ask at some point, what if we, instead of using a spider, we used a butterfly? <laughs> and the numbers doubled. They, they, they went, it went to like 60%. And so it, the public's opinion and not just opinion, but people vote with that opinion, right? And is, is very powerful, but relatively mismatched to the, to the values that the organisms play. Thankfully, our department and you know, uh, quite a few other state fish and wildlife departments don't take a popularity vote in terms of determining whether or not we're responsible for, for managing invertebrates, among other organisms. It's right in our mandate, legislatively, that we will conserve all species of fish and wildlife found in the state. And we have a pretty progressive definition of wildlife. It inclu includes um, all the vertebrates, not fish, because that's spelled out separately in, in, in statute, but and the invertebrates, right? So we're talking about suddenly we just went from three to 400 organisms to about 15 to 16,000 species that the department's responsible for, but indeed we are. So what I thought I'd do now is um, introduce you to how do we sort of triage our efforts with that incredibly ambitious mandate and this diversity of organisms, and I introduce you to a few tools 
uh, basic surveys, can't protect something if you don't know where it is, uh, research, regulation, and outreach. And, and in the course of doing that, I'm going to use some case studies from particular habitats so you can get used to a suite of organisms from that habitat and the, and the use of that tool. So let's talk about peatlands first. This is peatlands or bogs and fens, uh, wetlands that are, have organic substrate, um, cool, wet, acidic, pretty hostile places really. There's not a lot of diversity of vertebrates in most peatlands. Um, but what you will find there, and there's not a lot of diversity of organisms, period, but you'll find a really unique association of organisms here because of the adaptations that are required to live in these environments, particularly among plants and invertebrates. Now, this is the only slide I think I have of a plant in this program because I'm not going to talk about them anymore after this point. Um, but just don't forget that they're out there. They were low on the, t on the food chain in terms of the public opinion, but they, they are obviously very important. There's a sister agency in Maine, Maine Natural Areas Program at Department of Conservation that um, keeps track of and, and um, helps manage rare plants and natural communities. But I'll be talking about just the critters. And as, you go, as we go through the slides, you'll notice parenthetically an abbreviation by a lot of the characters that you're introduced to, and that refers to their conservation status in the state. So E would be endangered, T is threatened, and SC is special concern. Basic surveys, as I said, it's really, you, you got to know where something is, or even that it exists in your state, and we're still learning about new populations of organisms that have been here all along, been here for tens of thousands of years that we're just still discovering. Uh, not so much among vertebrates, but, uh, but among uh, plants and invertebrates, you can still do that. So peatlands, um, two groups that, really three groups of organisms that we keep track of the status of certain organisms in peatlands are, are the butterflies and moths, damselflies and dragonflies, and, and, and snails. And what you'll, two points I want to make with this slide. One is that uh, depending on the group of organisms, they have very specific microhabitats within those peatlands. And don't even bother trying to read them, but just take my word for it that, that you, if, you know, if you are in a peatland that doesn't have Atlantic white cedar, you can search till you're blue in the face and out of water and out of food, you'll never find a Hessel's hair streak, okay? That, it just absolutely has to have that element to the peatland for that species to be present. But the other point is that what we keep track of the status of, of organisms as best as we can, their conservation status, and the number of special concern species is always quite a bit larger than endangered or threatened. It's an internal watch list. It's mostly non-regulatory. And it's, we use it for organisms that we are certainly rare enough that they could justify endangered or threatened status, but we just don't have enough information or enough confidence in our own surveys to, to know that the species is indeed rare and vulnerable or, or just under-surveyed, cryptic and under-surveyed. And so there's quite a few in that category in peatlands in Maine. And it's only through surveys that we, you know, adjust these, these statuses are dynamic. I don't know if you can see this in red, but we just went through a, a state listing process and uh, two species got added to the uh, to endangered status, uh, a rare snail and a, and a butterfly that had been on our special concern list. And that was only through a lot of survey work over a decade of survey effort before we were confident enough to say, you know, there's still only one population of that butterfly in the state, and we've looked at um, dozens and dozens of bogs that have the right host plant, et cetera. So uh, I'm pretty sure that that thing is highly vulnerable. You know, one stochastic event could take out that population, let alone some kind of sort of chronic anthropogenic stress of some sort. And, and it works the other way as well, where we uh, downlist species, uh, Clayton's copper, and Ebony Bog Hunter was removed, uh, were down listed as well. As we get new survey information, we become more confident or, or, or reassured that there's more populations than we thought. 
So a lot of these surveys are highly specialized, very targeted. Um, old uh, gray beards like myself don't actually get out as much as we'd like to anymore, but we hire uh, professional contractors to do this kind of work with, that are very specialized and know uh, the particular taxa that they're working with. But we also, for, for a lot of uh, groups, we'll engage you and, and other uh, citizen scientists to help jumpstart our knowledge base on a, on a new group that we're trying to get new information on. Um, these are all, these are just uh, citizen science projects that our department is either the, the lead uh, in instigating or starting or a, a participating partner with, in some cases with Maine Audubon. And um, this is a real, this is an excellent way to get a lot of information in a short period of time. So just to take, for example, because we're talking about invertebrates here, two of the atlasing projects that are ongoing and recent right now, the Maine Butterfly Survey and the Maine Bumblebee Atlas, most of these projects share two basic, basic goals, these, these broad survey atlasing projects. One is science, obviously, right? It's fairly self-serving. There's a reason we're investing in the workshops and training volunteers and purchasing materials, nets, and designing field forms and databases, et cetera. And that's to increase our, our knowledge about the group. But inevitably in doing that and working with volunteers over well, what's now nearly 10 years with the Maine Butterfly Survey, you get a, you, you get a constituency of, of, that you didn't have before that's very interested in that group of organisms and invertebrates generally. Because butterflies and dragonflies, bumblebees, are, they're conspicuous, they're big, they're diurnal, they like the sun, they're easy to work with. But you know, once you get people turned on to some of these uh, larger, uh, more accessible, if you will, uh, invertebrates, inevitably you get uh, folks sort of turned on to a whole nother world of invertebrate conservation more generally. So that's, that's certainly an incidental benefit of, um, of these atlasing projects. This is just one slide to summarize for example, the kinds of ways you can quantify what the outreach and scientific contributions are from, from a single atlasing project. So in, in nine years, we've engaged a fair number of volunteers, done a, a lot of trainings, had a fair amount of uh, outreach coverage, but incredible amount of records accumulated, many of which are uh, uh, county records. And this is for a group of organisms that had been studied for a century uh, previous to the atlas in 2006. So, and yet we still found over 200 county records, 10 state species records. One of those state species records was a new U.S. national record of a breeding butterfly right here in Maine that had been here all along. Um, not a little cryptic grass skipper. Or this was a, a swallowtail, one of the largest species that we now have in the state of Maine. It is, uh, is living in a swamp up in Fort Kent. And, um, and my son, the little bastard, found it. <laughs> um, he told me, he, this could be a long story and I'll keep it really short, but um, basically uh, as a budding teenager, I felt like I had a, a short window of opportunity left to engage him in uh, a sort of father-son outreach natural history expedition. And we went, I told him we were gonna go look for this butterfly, that it was a long shot, it had never been found, it was unlikely, you know, that as a rare ologist, you strike out nine out of 10 times. That's why the critters you're looking for are interesting. And I, I wasn't even quite done with that speech when he, we, we pulled up to a site where that had the host plant. He got out of the truck and uh, walked over to the, the um, um, this is the absolute dead truth. He walked over to the very first uh, cow parsnip, which is the host plant for this butterfly. And he'd looked at some pictures with me the night before in a hotel uh, of what the caterpillars were. And before, and as I was giving him this little spiel, he flipped over the leaf and said, is, is this one? <laughs> and it was a mature caterpillar of the short-tailed swallowtail, which is a much better record than an adult. That's a breeding resident record, right? The, 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 that means a female laid an egg the egg hatched, it grew into a mature cat. You have a breeding population, right? And uh, 
And he said, Dad, your job's not that hard. You've always made it sound like <laughs> Anyway. Um, and I'll, obviously, the, the goal is to get this material, to contribute to science, but you know, as much as what, what, when we put this a pen to paper and, and, and tabulate our results and produce an atlas, I think one of the real spin-off benefits is all the gaps in the maps, right? That's, it's all those places where we still don't have knowledge that you tend to f help steer people to when you produce a publication like this. And so you'll, you should look for a bumblebee atlas and a, and a dragonfly atlas and a butterfly atlas in the next few, in, in the next couple of years. So let's talk about research a little bit and use streams, rivers, riparian areas as a, as our case study habitat, if you will. There's um, just so many organisms. Uh, riparian habitats are so rich. It's one of the richest uh, in terms of sheer diversity of organisms, uh, habitats that we have in Maine and, and anywhere really um, on the landscape. And it, you know, we're talking about organisms that are entirely aquatic, that never leave the, uh, the stream bed, uh, such as freshwater mussels. Um, and then organisms that spend their larval life, life history perhaps in the stream and then as adults are, are found in the riparian forest or in the, in the um, substrate adjacent to the stream. So a whole wide breadth of organisms. And before we delve into looking at one of those groups, the, the mayflies, I just wanted to point out that this was a study done um, by NatureServe, a branch of uh, a sort of a, what, what used to be the natural heritage arm of the Nature Conservancy. And they looked at all of the organisms across taxa in North America and quantified imperilment patterns. And two points, there's a lot of points that could be said, but two major points is ac across all taxa, and, we, and I've only got a sample here, but if you look at their publication across all taxa, about a third of all organisms really in the uh, United States were determined to be at some level of imperilment. These are non-political assignments, so it's not uh, sort of fickle and, and based on uh, state or federal endangered threatened species stat. These are objective uh, imperilment criteria. And so that was kind of sobering because here we are, one of the wealthiest countries in, in the world, right? Um, and we have uh, a third of our flora and fauna that is um, imperiled. Um, the blue histograms on these bars are actually extinct. You'll never see those organisms again. And the other point being that a disproportionate number of the most imperiled organisms are aquatic. And a lot, and a lot of those aquatics, the freshwater mussels, crayfish, mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, fish, and salamanders are uh, associated with stream and river and riparian systems. So one of the sort of holy grails of, if there can be such a thing in the mayfly world, is the toma mayfly. All right, this is, there's literally all of about um, maybe, uh, maybe a dozen uh, individuals that have ever in, uh, handled or observed this species before. But this is a really um, fascinating species that's the only living member of its genus. It, it's, it's considered a living fossil, not just for that reason, but also because of several of its traits. It's actually carnivorous as, instead of being herbivorous, like all of its mayfly uh, brethren. And um, it was in, indeed thought to have gone extinct because only a single population had been found in New York in the 30s and a, an impoundment went in wiped out the population because it needs a free-flowing river system for, for the reasons you'll see in a minute. And Cassie Gibbs, our own Cassie Gibbs at University of Maine Orono, discovered a population on Toma Stream, hence the common name. And we've since, and she helped our department through some research collaboration uh, with some techniques that helped us identify several more populations since. But the real key to the researching uh, um, the life cycle of this species was to identify a gap in the life cycle that just hadn't been known before. For most mayflies, we know as adults, they, they're in the order ephemeroptera, that means essentially ephemera. They don't live very long, literally just days. 
but they'll lay their eggs in the river, the eggs will mature in the river, the immature nymphs will spend their time in the river. We'll see the uh, immature adults in the riparian vegetation and the adults coming down to the river. But the missing link here was this, where were the mature nymphs? And they hadn't been found. Cassie Gibbs discovered that the mature nymphs in this species spend all of their time in these warm sedge pocket pools in wet meadows adjacent to free-flowing streams and rivers. And these wet meadows are kept open from woody succession because of ice scour and high water in the spring that knocks back the woody vegetation, creates these uh, herbaceous sedge meadows in, adjacent to the, and the mature nymphs get up there and, and actually prey on other mayflies and other insects in these uh, sedge pocket pools. And it's the best place to survey for the species as well. So that was, that's just an example of how one sort of key life history attribute uh, with, um, you know, with the help of uh, other researchers helping us key in on that just enabled us to really um, increase our knowledge dramatically. Now we have 20 of 21 populations known in the world here in Maine um, because of uh, Cassie's help. And that, re you know, when we do research, it's, it very often is obviously is very applied research uh, and we focus on sort of limiting factors, life history factors, habitat relationships, movement, biology. That, that influences our ability to do survey work and it influences our ability to manage and conserve the species, right? So, you know, previously and, and, and for any organism that we don't have very good information on habitat relationships or or the movement ecology, we put these generic uh, mapping uh, circles to depict their occurrence for our own internal mapping and for outreach, for habitat outreach purposes. But in this case, we're able to really refine that to, to design primary and secondary habitat protocols to map the full extent of the habitat, to grab the wet meadow habitat within the dispersal range of the species, et cetera. So we, we try to put this research to good purpose. And this is just a sample of other research projects that our department's been involved with previously with the check marks or the other bullets on the bottom that we're currently involved with with other entities. So very often, you know, we don't have a lot of staff and a lot of time and a lot of um, maybe, not even, maybe not enough expertise, frankly, to be able to delve into the limiting factors of some esoteric mayfly or freshwater mussel species. But it's, you know, it's on our endangered and threatened species list. We're mandated to prevent it from going extinct. So we try to work with expertise outside the department, very often faculty and students at colleges and universities to uh, design a project, we might bring some resources, some funding, some questions, the species obviously, and, uh, and then they work with them to help uh, answer some of the questions that we need answered to be able to manage the species. All right, let's go on to another tool, um, regulation and an environmental review. We're gonna use pitch pine scrub oak barrens as an example of a habitat type where this could play out, although it could play out anywhere, um, where we have you know, a, a jurisdictional species or, or habitat issue. But pitch pine barrens are really interesting from an invertebrate perspective because they're just so, again, not, not particularly diverse like peatlands, but really unique in terms of the, the biota that's found there. Um, I think in the, at the Waterboro Barrens, uh, I remember Nancy Safera wrote up a report, she's a nature conservancy biologist, where she, in one field season she found 300 and something like 365 species of butterflies and moths just on the Waterboro Barrens, one pitch pine scrub oak barren, which is, you know, it's more than all breeding bird species in the entire state, just, in, just at one site for one group of organisms. So just a quick reminder, these are uh, fire adapted, super dry uh, soils, sandy soil uh, habitats that occur on these sandy outwash, glacial outwash uh, soils, very often dominated by pitch pine in the overstory, scrub oak uh, in, the, in the understory, and several other plant, unique, interesting plant species as well. And 
it, this is the first time you've seen, seen an EXT, and that unfortunately that means the species is extirpated in the state. Those two butterflies and a third actually, um, Perseus dusky wing, all blinked out when we lost wild lupin as a host plant from some of the barrens in Norway and southwestern Maine. You're used to seeing lupin along the roadsides in Maine, but the, the lupin you see now is a non-native lupin. And it looks a heck of a lot like the native lupin, but the chemistry of the plant is such that it can't, these species, the, the Lepidoptera associated with a wild lupin cannot breed on uh, introduced exotic lupin. So they blinked out when that species and the barrens that hosted that plant species blinked out. So regulation, um, our department does, you know, mostly it's, uh, we're not a regulatory agency for the most part, but there are, uh, we obviously have regulations around hunting and fishing uh, laws. And on the other extreme, we do, we have uh, a regulation that we're primarily responsible for enforcing and administrating for species that are on the brink, that, um, that, that don't have sustainable populations in the state. And that's the Maine Endangered Species Act. There's 50 species on that as of uh, last year. We just added a few, uh, six new species to the, to, to the list of state endangered and threatened species. And the, there's a lot of, there's several things that are prohibited and you know, that give us comfort and assurance, at least in writing, that a species is protected once it's listed as endangered and, or threatened. But the primary threat to most endangered and threatened species in Maine is not the fact that they're being moved around the landscape or sold or transported. It's the biggest issue is what for endangered and threatened species, not just here, but everywhere. Habitat loss and habitat fragmentation to primarily to development. And there's really only two uh, uh, verbs in the, in the whole, in, in the entire Maine Endangered Species Act statute that give us jurisdiction to do anything about habitat loss, but they, we, we do invoke them and they do help us and, they, and we do have the ability to provide limited uh, habitat protection for species that are state listed as endangered or threatened. Um, because of the taking, which means killing provisions and harassment, which uh, is defined as any activity that significantly disrupts natural behavioral patterns. So this is uh, a collage of the state endangered and threatened species in Maine that Mark McCullough put together, a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biologist. And you know, it is comforting and uh, interesting to see that there's some invertebrates along the margins here, right? Uh, so that's good news. Um, I guess the sort of glass half empty perspective is that it's not very many, right? There's, um, there's only 20 main invertebrate species that have some kind of listing status. That may sound like a lot, but, but proportional to their, rep to their numbers on the landscape, it's uh, you know, an infinitesimal percentage compared to representation by the vertebrate groups that are on the endangered species list in Maine, which are fairly well represented, uh, you know, in the realm of five to 10% of uh, birds and mammals and reptiles are, are pre and fish are present on the list. Um, why is that? Is that because invertebrates are just sort of inherently more uh, stable, uh, less vulnerable to the same stressors and, and vulnerabilities that cause extinction in other species? And I would say probably not, and, and the evidence suggests not. This is a list of the best I could do to pull together a, a list of main extinct and extirpated species. And there's 19 species up there, and that alone might be a little sobering. Some people think Maine, wow, that's a kind of a big wilderness state with relatively little development going on and um, must be a wildlife refuge for species in the Northeast. Well, we've lost quite a number of species that you're unlikely to ever see again, certainly in your lifetime and probably your children and grandchildren's and some species here are extinct, which means they're gone from the face of the planet. But the bigger point for the purposes of this talk is that half of the species known to be, to have blinked out in Maine are invertebrates. Okay, so, and that's 
and you can be sure there's a lot more than that because they're not, it's, it's not easy to document in an invertebrate extirpation. Not, it's not quite as you know, conspicuous as when the last golden eagle pair stopped breeding in Maine um, not very many years ago. But so it, 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 it's not that invertebrates aren't susceptible to the very same issues of habitat loss, pollution, habitat fragmentation, climate change, and um, all the other stressors that affect other taxa. So just to give you a quick, real sketch, quick example of how you know, we might use the Maine Endangered Species Act to help protect habitat for, a, for one of those few species that is on um, the list. We have an endangered and threatened butterfly on the right-hand side that were both documented here in a barren's habitat in Shapley. Um, I documented both of those guys uh, in, this, in this barrens. And then we had a proposed 14 unit, 14 unit subdivision that was proposed in the red boundary, as you see there, which took up about 80 to 90 percent of the parcel. And through the, an environmental review process and, and looking at the, 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 the biology of the species and the distribution of the species on site, we were able to permit the development to go forward with really quite modest reduction in units, just went from a 14 to a 12 unit subdivision by moving uh, the footprint of the subdivision a little bit closer to the, to the road and opening up about 40 to 50 percent of the, of the parcel to an open space block that included the, the, the host plant, scrub oak, that the larvae needed for eggs and, and larval development and some nectaring habitat for the adults adjacent to that. So it, we, we can, you know, make in, limited but important um, protections for state, state endangered and threatened species, not just invertebrates. And the last tool I wanted to talk about uh, is outreach, a, a, a completely non-regulatory tool that I think is essential, really important, probably the most important tool that we have, really. Um, and I thought I'd use vernal pools as an example. You might, um, well, yeah, before, this might be an interesting illustration. How, before I talk anything more about vernal pools, just the term vernal pools and thinking about it in your head, if you've ever even heard the term before, how many people, raise your hand if you've heard the term and you think if you were asked you could even sort of describe roughly, not scientifically, but roughly what a vernal pool is. I'm not gonna ask you to, but if you thought you, you could, Okay, just about everybody, 80 to 90 percent of the people in the room raised their hand. That tells me that outreach is, is a pretty effective tool because 10 or 15 years ago when I would give talks on just vernal pools, um, almost nobody would raise their hand. It, it's, it's a topic that's gotten a lot of discussion and there's been a lot of education and outreach on the organisms and the needs and the, what makes vernal pools unique. So. I won't even des describe what a vernal pool is since almost all of you rose, rose your hand, but it's, uh, well, I will in a, in a sound bite. It's, it's a small depression uh, in the woods, generally in a wooded setting that doesn't have any surface, permanent surface hydro hydrological connection to a stream. So the, they tend to dry out and, they, and, they're, and they're fishless. And those two characteristics make them very unique because they, they're occupied by a group of organisms that do, are much more successful in a, in a fishless environment than they are in a, in a fishy place. So you might be wondering why we're talking about uh, vernal pools if, we're, if this is an invertebrate program, when we know that they're so important to some of the state's amphibians and reptiles. But uh, you might not have known, um, but there's an incredible diversity of invertebrates that occupy vernal pools. And these are not only, uh, and then within these groups, so for example, uh, insects such as dragonflies and caddisflies and beetles or mollusks such as snails and uh, fingernail clams or crustaceans like fairy shrimp and uh, ostracods and copepods, uh, within those three major groups is where most of the invertebrates lie, uh, 
And there's an incredible turnover in the actual species, the cast of characters as hydro period gets lengthened and, and, you, and you move away from a ephemeral vernal pool setting to a permanent marshy pond setting, you'll get a whole, uh, you'll get a whole different suite of characters. So vernal pools have a unique and very diverse uh, suite of species of, of invertebrates as well as uh, reptiles and amphibians. But they, the challenge with vernal pools is they have a couple of strikes against them. One, they're small, right? They sort of by definition, they're sort of these pocket depressions and generally, in most things in life we tend to think is bigger is better. <laughs> and it's not, uh, it's not really true. And in fact, it's reflected even in wetland regulations here in Maine and, and elsewhere and federally that uh, larger wetlands get more, generally have stronger regulatory protections than smaller wetlands. And that's, a, some, something, that's improving, but that's somewhat thing of an artifact from uh, the perception that larger wetlands just have everything a small wetland has plus more. But like we said just a moment ago, vernal pools have a unique suite of species that you don't have when you move into a, a larger, more permanent system. And the other strike they have against them is that they're temporary, right? So even a well-intentioned landowner or developer or uh, even natural resource professional until recently in the state may have not have uh, recognized or uh, a dry basin in the woods as being very important. And, and so they can be tough to recognize, just to identify on the landscape. Small, temporary, and the other big strike they have against them, sort of the third strike that really knocks them out is the life history connection that the organisms that breed in the pools have with the surrounding forest. This is really challenging. There's a lot of real estate <laughs> that's uh, required to maintain a sustainable population of wood frogs and blue spotted salamanders, which is uh, a relative of the Jefferson salamander and spotted salamanders in Maine. Uh, you probably can't read the bottom, but we, we know pretty well how far out into the forest they go, what their average migration distance is, because we've put little backpacks with radio transmitters on them. We've tracked them. Uh, some of the students here in Maine and faculty have helped with this work. And we, 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 we even have estimates on averages and means. And so uh, there's been enough work now to tell us that outside of a very short, rather conspicuous, it's, and coming right up, by the way, uh, incredibly um, here, uh, shortly after the rains, I think, in the next week or two, after a really short breeding season in the pools when the salamanders and frogs are really conspicuous, the other 11 to 11 and a half months of the year, they're basically unseen, unheard, hundreds of feet away from the pool in a, in a mostly forested setting um, and, and require that mostly forested setting in order to, uh, to spend 95% of the calendar year where they feed, migrate, estivate, overwinter, and do all the other things they do outside of breeding. So it's a big challenge to conserve vernal pools. Um, you may have heard that there is a, there's, this, there's some kind of regulation out there around, some, around significant vernal pools. Um, and so you're wondering why is this under the outreach piece? Well, the, the reason is, is because significant vernal pools are a very small subset of the sort of universe of vernal pools out there. In fact, of the 2,500 vernal pools that we've assessed to date as an agency in collaboration with DEP through development review projects, um, only, uh, only uh, let's see here, what? Um, only 18% of them have been identified as significant, okay? And, and three to 4% as potentially significant. So it, the number varies over time, but somewhere on the order of 20 to 25% of the vernal pools qualify for this rather stringent definition of what's a significant vernal pool uh, that's eligible for limited protections at that point under the Natural Resources Protection Act. And we have them, we map them. But that means that the other 75 to 80 percent of the vernal pools on the landscape are not eligible for any kind of regulatory protection. And because they're small, they tend to fall through the cracks of existing wetland regulations. And um, 
there's, you know, there's no substitute for just good education and outreach in terms of trying to protect some of these special places, um, helping uh, leverage the efforts of an organization like this and other land trusts and towns to help protect open space that has have high value vernal pools and other features on them. And I guess the, the point I make here on the bottom is that, you know, regulation and policy is a fine tool, but science doesn't wait around. You know, science happens. It, uh, I forget who quoted that, that there's a quote out there that an astronomer made that basically says, the neat thing about science is it's true whether or not you believe it. <laughs> and, um, and it just keeps happening. And so as a result, you know, we can glean uh, the best the, uh, management guidance we can get out of science as it evolves, but regulations and policies will always lag behind our ability to get out in front and educate and work with willing landowners and um, you know other constituents. And so, developers we share best development practices with. Foresters we've been sharing forest habitat management guidelines with, um, and there's other uh, uh, guidelines that are evolving all the time that are that we can choose to embrace. And, you know, Vernal Pool Outreach, there's a whole, there's a, these are tools as a land trust and an advocacy organization. You're probably familiar with many of these non-regulatory tools that the sort of gold standard being if, if you want to protect it, shut up and buy it. That's, that's, I think that comes right from the executive director of the Nature Conservancy uh, two generations back. Um, but that's that. That was their philosophy, and they've uh, and Maine has the greatest number of land trusts per capita, I think, than any other state in the union. And so, conservation easements and fee acquisitions around not just vernal pools, but all of the important little features that we care about is uh, certainly very, very important. And with that, I'm going to wrap up and just say, I'd like to, just like to acknowledge some of my colleagues that in the department that um, do work on invertebrate conservation. Um, everyone in the department is involved once you get to the level of policy. But these are sort of our, some of our frontline biologists. Um, some of the colleagues that we rely on outside of the department are numerous because, as I said, through the research component, there's so many aspects um, to the biology of these organisms and the diversity of life histories that we need to rely on other organizations and experts and funding. Just a word about funding. I usually go into this a little longer, but I knew this was going to be a, 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 a long program, so I want, I'm cutting it short. So stay with me for a moment. There's two primary sources of stateside funding that we are able to generate on our own as a department that basically funds most of our non-game and endangered species work. And that is the, the loon license plate um, and the chickadee checkoff. And I really want to thank anyone who's embraced either of those programs. They're really important because they help us leverage federal funds that we wouldn't be able to touch otherwise at a rate of two to three times. So for every dollar of loon plate and chickadee checkoff dollar that we raise, we can bring two to three dollars of US Fish and Wildlife Service dollars through state wildlife grants to the table. And that's been huge in terms of operational budgets, for programs, for staff salaries, for um, basically everything that I talked about in this program, and, and more for all the taxa for all the non-invertebrate, non-game taxa that I didn't talk about. So thank you, and I think if there's time, we can do questions, discussion, comments, whatever you like to do. Thank you very much. It was the, I can tell you roughly that it, I know there was a Barrens in Norway. It's the, that's the only location we have um, records for those three extirpated butterflies. <coughs> And we know that those three butterflies are obligate wild lupin feeders as caterpillars. It's not the adults of butterflies that are really host specific, it's the caterpillars. Mm -hmm. The adults are just sugar eaters, they'll drink nectar, nectar from anything. But the caterpillar is keyed into the chemistry of just that 
wild lupin plant. And um, yeah, so uh, we actually have the specimens for all three of those species documented from museum collections outside of Maine. So we know they were here. We know the collector. We know the date. It was, I don't have the date offhand, but it was the early part of this century. I'm going to say that the Norway barons were present until some, something on the order of the 20s, 30s, or 40s. I'm not really sure. Maybe Steve knows. <laughs> so are the, yeah. are the lupins we see elsewhere now native, essentially? Yes, yeah, the highway lupin, so the, so the lupins you see along roads every, yeah. here in Maine or elsewhere in New England are almost certainly all non-native, uh, yeah, domesticated, variety, feral now uh, lupins. They're beautiful. I like them. I wish I have plenty of them myself, but um, they don't do the job for, for these guys. <laughs> Is there a chemistry? Yeah, yeah. Uh, butterflies and moths evolved at about the same time that flowering plants did. Like, we're talking about 150 to 200 million years ago, and they've they've been evolving. Plants have been evolving a chemistry to deter herbivores, not just butterflies and moths, but all kinds of herbivores over time, um, chemical toxins, uh, and and. Butterflies and moths in particular have uh, developed enzymes and metabolites to break down those uh, chemical properties. And, it's, and, it's, and they've done this for millions of years to the point where some species can only reproduce now on one plant. One, very often it's a genus or a group of plants. But in some cases, like the Atlantic white cedar that I introduced at the beginning of the talk, Hessel's hair streak, can, that's the only plant in the world that it can survive on. So hmm. it's a strategy that works pretty well when you have very little competition for herbivory, when you've specialized sort of the lock and key chemistry mechanism for breaking down the properties of that plant. But then when, when the plant becomes endangered because of habitat loss or some other factor, then you're out of luck. 